Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. You're building a road network that is equivalent to the size of the entire U.S. road network, and they're building it from scratch, and that's going to require vast amounts of money to maintain. It's the largest as Roads are the largest assets yeah. that cities, counties, and states, and even national governments own. Hey, everybody. It's Scott. It's Wednesday, and it's the Pitchworks Podcast. I've been hoping to get this gentleman into our studio for a long, long time. His name is Mark DeSantis. He is the CEO of Roadbotics, and uh, he has been through the wars. I am I'm very happy to have him in here sharing some insights with us. Uh, Roadbotics is a cool company. Like Honestly, I'm a big fan of what they're doing over there. The, the idea is... And I, I don't want to steal all of his thunder. I will just say, you don't know how much you're paying to maintain roads. I'll just leave it there, right? And and Mark is going to make it a lot easier for you to understand that particular conundrum. And he's bringing high-tech stuff to what he calls a big and boring problem, which that's the kind of thing I've made a lot of money on over the years. I hope... Uh, I hope some of you wake up to some of those opportunities. Before we get into the interview, I'm going to recommend that you rate and review this fine program, if only because uh, if you do, uh, there's a very good likelihood that you will win a prize. Okay, that's, that's, that's a flat out lie. But I'd like you to do it anyway. It helps other people who might uh, enjoy the show. It helps them to find it, and it does. It means a lot to Buzzy and me and the people who make the show. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Let's talk to Mark. Let's find out what's going on at Roadbotics. All right, one of the few guests we've ever had with his own Wikipedia page. And you know what? There's something weird about that. Mm-hmm. Mark DeSantis, how are you? Yeah, good. That is weird. I have never not got, still haven't gotten over it, but... I, it, I don't think you're missing a ton. I think you were there for most of the story. Now, normally I would bring you in here and I'm like, Mark, pitch me on Roadbox. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to pitch you on it instead yeah. because I want to find out if I'm right. No, and, and I want to try to prioritize yeah. the things that I think are really cool. Yeah. Because you're kind of playing in the, no disrespect intended, the boring end of the pool that everybody yeah. overlooks. Yeah. And that's where I think the money is. I, I, yeah, I, I always. love those ones. Yeah. You found a way to make it so that a road repair is one tiny fraction yeah. of what it would normally cost. Yeah. And you're using infrastructure that already belongs to the municipality. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the way to think of it is uh, we inspect roads with AI and cell phone. And the best analogy, which is pretty close, um, is radiologists are look at x-rays to, to find out if you have cancer. Right. And cancer, if you think of cancer as a pothole, what you're really looking for if you're a radiologist are the precursors to cancer so that a small remedy can prevent the cancer from ever showing up. In the same vein, if you can see features on a surface, subtle precursors to the bigger problems like a pothole, a small inexpensive fix can push out or prevent that pothole from happening and extend the useful life of that road indefinitely. If I remember correctly, you said yep. it was like 20 times more expensive to fill it. Yeah. And that doesn't actually do anything useful. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, it's fair. It, it's interesting. And, and there, I didn't know this when I, I, I took roads for granted. I said, well, it's, what's a road? It's some asphalt, big deal. It's actually quite <laughs> quite sophisticated. There's a layer cake in any, you know, take the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, the roads are actually a layer cake of um, carefully constructed surfaces stacked one on top of another so that a truck and a car can can go over it and the road doesn't fall apart. And the asphalt is simply nothing more than a sheet covering and protecting those load-bearing surfaces below it. And what that asphalt, that sheet, is really doing is preventing the outside world from getting at the load-bearing surfaces and messing them up. And the big problem the outside world brings is water. Water is a big, big issue. Right. So when an, a pavement engineer sees a road and they see a crack... Um, they see a breach in that surface and they immediately react because, oh my goodness, now water can get through the asphalt down to the subsurface and wreak havoc. So a pothole is an extreme version of that, of that penetration, which means that it's only going to, it's going to require an extreme fix. And so when you see a pothole, just like cancer, it's going to require a very expensive surgery, if you will, to fix it. 
And the surgery in the in the United States generally runs you about two to three million bucks a mile. So when you see a series of potholes, Whew, okay. you're seeing a road that is dead. Yeah. When you see the patches that looks like patches on patches on patches, the patient died. Oh, Liberty Avenue. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a it's a patient that died long ago yeah. and they're continuing to do surgery on it and to no avail. So if you can catch it early, you can extend that useful life of that road indefinitely. It's it's interesting um to me because I get the feeling like a lot of people uh they think of AI as a way to attack database problems. They think of it right. as a way, like we have all this useful data and, yeah. and they keep telling it, us it's oil. Yeah. Can we squeeze the oil and you know make some right. more money? Um, meanwhile, you've identified, and I'm going to use your term, markers that say like mm-hmm. we could save money if we get here quick. Yeah. Now, if I understand the rest of your pitch, what you're doing is you're putting the the cameras, the sensory cameras on vehicles that the municipality already owns, or at least that's the ideal. Does that feel right, or am I wrong? Uh, any vehicle, anything that's moving, yeah. actually. So, And the, the sensor is nothing more than a standard cell phone. That's nice. So basically, you just download an app on a smartphone, put the camera pointed forward, you know, positioned on, uh, not unlike an Uber driver has. When you right, like a car. dash cam kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anywhere in the windshield. Turn the app on, drive, collects all the image data. As soon as the phone sees a Wi-Fi, friendly Wi-Fi, takes all the data out, and then it takes that image data, isolates the road from all the other stuff in the image. Nice. And then looks at the road for about four dozen patterns. And this is where AI really makes all the, a world of difference in a lot of areas. What AI does well is what we rely on humans to do right now, and that's fading fast, which is we pay people, very well-trained people, to look at stuff yeah. <laughs> and then make a judgment. Yeah. So you think of all the people who are paid to look at stuff. Uh, I use the example of radiologists to look at x-rays. Perfect. They are highly skilled. Um, bridge inspectors, lawyers looking at standard uh, con- employment contracts, for example. Uh, there's a lot of people that are looking at things, and the problem with that is is a problem we solve, an AI solves, which is the sub- what I call the subjectivity-objectivity problem. And it sounds complicated. It's actually pretty simple. If I have five radiologists uh, look at the same x-ray, we will get four opinions. And the only thing they'll agree on, the only thing they'll agree on are the extreme values. So the radiologist will agree on there's absolutely no cancer there. And this person definitely has cancer. And generally, those five uh, radiologists will agree on that. Unfortunately, the most useful information is the information that tells you the state of of that person between those extremes. Because what I'm trying to do is determine the state of that person. If all all I'm doing is saying, you know, you're going to die tomorrow, and anyone could have seen that, that radiologist isn't terribly useful. (laughs) Right. If, if 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 another radiologist is saying there's absolutely nothing in this image that's worth seeing, well, that's not useful either. What the radiologist is trying to see are instances where they can tell you what degree that uh, how far along something has progressed up oh, there's something there that could get bad got to check that that's what people who inspect things do a lawyer who would look through a very long contract and see two sentences and say you know this could be a problem a bridge inspector who will look at the joint on a bridge and say this could be a problem a road surface a pavement inspector same thing they're looking for the intermediate states right so that a small fix can say you know if we just sealed this crack here we won't have that problem later here's what's cool about that though because if you sent me to inspect a road or a bridge or whatever yeah that's an appointment on us on a calendar right so and, and and this to me seems like a key value as well yeah so you say to me scott it's Tuesday. That means that you've got to go out to exactly. the 31st Street Bridge. You've got to right. go out to the Rachel Carson Bridge yeah. and just make sure that the stress points and the things that you're looking for get checked out. Yep. So I make a plan, figure out where I'm going to park. <laughs> you know, yeah. I meet up with some, I don't know, the, the person who's in charge of that bridge from the yeah. public works team and maybe like my apprentice that's coming from, you and know, maybe I'm a little hung over from last night and maybe I'm in a bad mood. Never. And <laughs> never. I, I think much more highly of you, sir. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's all that stuff, right? Your point. Yeah. But it's an appointment. So right. it's an hour. Right. I mean, the, the, the outlook standard is 60 minutes, is it not? Right. So well, you go, well, let's go down there and, yep. you know, we can BS a little bit about how your kids are doing in Little League and everything else. Yeah. And the robotics move is 
I'm going to use city bus for an example, because city buses are yeah. just all up and down. Even yeah. if you get a bad read on this trip, the right. next trip is 20 minutes behind it. Yeah. And you go, no, we've looked at that thing five different ways yeah. without putting an Outlook appointment on anyone's calendar. Exactly. So I want to share with your listeners a little a little secret. So not secret is the fact that BMW, uh, Bavarian Motor Works, invested in our company, put yes. about a half million in it. Um, if you go, and they own Mini, so if you go to the local Mini dealership here in Center Avenue, uh, or in in, um, in Pittsburgh, what you'll see, the, all the new minis have a little camera right behind the rear view mirror pointed, not backward, but forward. That's cool. But forward. And as you start to think about that, what in the world would BMW do with a camera facing forward? Well, the new oil. Yep. So the reality is every car that's going to be built now and around the world and forever will have not just a camera facing backward for backup yeah it's actually going to have forward facing and possibly even side facing cameras everything with wheels is now a mobile platform for collecting massive amounts of data the question is right now and we're just a little thin slice of that scott we're just a little nook little little small piece of that but it's a big big iceberg it's a, you're slicing, it's a right. massive opportunity and i say there's there's gold in that roadway so Think of just, if I ask your listeners, just sit in your car and stare, if you're on a road, yeah, perhaps in a city, and just stare out the windshield and look at all the stuff on a road and think about how many of those things change, mm -hmm. who owns that thing, and how would I know how it's changed? And by the way, is anybody inspecting that? And that would include not just road surfaces, it would include all the roadway furniture i got one for you the road that i live on when there's a heavy rain yeah. there's a pool that yeah. forms and a lot of times you can't see it so yeah. next thing you know your uh the oregon trail example you're fording the river right yeah <laughs> yeah, like, yeah and your electrical shot like i've seen yeah. try, twice a year on my road some car ends up with its electrical system shot because it got flooded yep i i have to believe that's the same general concept All that you've that got stuff power lines with vegetation most power outages are caused caused by tree branches falling on power lines could you see the extent to which vegetation might be yeah interfering with a power line uh trucks parked where they shouldn't be it's a long list and and and, and ai combined with some image process cameras basically um can see that stuff once you've trained it and if you have it collected passively and AI can automatically take an image and see a thing you've told it to look for. Yeah. Now you've changed the world because now the roadway is not this abstract concept. It's actually something that's analyzed every day. It's not 10,000 of hours of Outlook appointments yeah. to fix, improve, yeah. observe, inspect. Now, let me add a phenomenon that, that's a bit of a tailwind that we couldn't possibly have anticipated. And that's the autonomous vehicle revolution right. that is just now starting to see the glimmers. I, I was in California and I saw this really fascinating pitch. It was done by uh, an autonomous vehicle consultant. And he showed a picture of Madison Avenue, basically looking down Madison Avenue in 1900. And people have complained about this autonomous vehicle revolution and say it's never going to happen or it's going to be 50 years before we see them. And, and he said, no. Nope. Get a horse. He said, you're wrong. He said, he showed the... Madison Avenue, 1900, and it was one car, all horses and buck and uh, and carts. And then he somehow had gotten a photograph of Madison Avenue, more or less same point of view for 1913. <laughs> I've seen this. Yes, all cars, one horse. That was a hundred years ago. That Actually, happened. I just realized I saw it in your presentation. Yeah, through yeah, Ty yeah. Pittsburgh. <laughs> right, and that that was a hundred years ago, Scott. And and so this revolution is going to happen. So what does that have to do with robotics? So the reality is that if you think about it, autonomous vehicles mean that you and I will no longer own cars. Right, yeah. We, we will be using probably one of a dozen fleets in the United States. So we have 260 million individual car automobile owners. Right now, that'll go down to a dozen. And it'll go down to a dozen vehicle owners. And it'll be companies like Mercedes, uh, Daimler, uh, perhaps Tesla, Uber, who knows, They'll mm -hmm. own these fleets that we use, and we don't care. So if you think of the roadway now as not servicing your, you and me individually as a way to move around, but a dozen fleets are the primary users of, of the 4 million paved miles in the United States, what they're going to do is they're going to say, you know what? 
why don't we take care of these roads? So they're going to go to the city of Pittsburgh and they're going to say, you know what? We're going to lease your entire road network right. for the next 50 years. And we're going to pay to maintain those roads. You can Makes still them more them. efficient, keeps them from doing repairs and right. losing axles. And-, and we won't care because we are no longer, if you will, consumers of the road. We're consumers of transportation. What that means is there'll be a renaissance in the rebuilding of the entire six and a half trillion dollar wow, wait, road network. Six and a half trillion dollars? The replacement value of the US road work no okay. road, road network. <laughs> That's is a lot of money. Six and a half trillion dollars. It's a really hard number to conceive of. Hundred billion dollars a year spent to maintain yeah. four million miles of road just in the United States. The world in the world, believe it or not, there's about twenty five million paved miles. And the globally, about a third of a trillion is spent every year to maintain those ro- those paved miles. China, That's insane. China, people have heard of the um, Silk Road, the right. sometimes built one built one road. They're building across from essentially uh, Western China all the way into Southeastern Europe and the Middle East. They're building a road network that is equivalent to the size of the entire U.S. road network. And they're building it from scratch. And that's going to require vast amounts of money to maintain. It's the largest asset. Roads are the largest assets yeah. that cities, counties, and states, and even national governments own. You actually just teed me up for where I want to go next, which yeah. is, it seems like the last two or three times I've seen you at these different events, yeah. you're just getting off a plane from somewhere. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I'm curious, right? Like, Am I right that this is a better pitch overseas right now? Yeah, it is. It, it, Scott, that's a good point. Uh, we are we do a lousy job with our roads in the United States. Shameful. We're the wealthiest country in the world. We're a massive country. We have a massive road network simply because of the scale of our the size of our country. Yeah, we brought we brought cars to the mainstream, yeah, and, and we built the first massive uh, road network. I give credit to the Romans two thousand years ago. They built a fifty thousand mile road network. Um, to their credit, but. To this day, that would dwarf anything the Romans built way back when. And we have a tradition of not necessarily taking care of these roads the way they do in, I can tell you for a fact, because we collected data there. In Japan, we have customers actually in Australia. We have customers in Europe, uh, in the UK. Uh, we've even done analysis of roads in South America and other parts of the world. And I I have different theories about why that is true, that we do such a poor job. But I think one of them has to do with the fact that we just have had the resources to do it. Our approach in the U.S. has been, you know what? Okay, it's bad. Let's tear it up and replace it because we can afford to do it. I'm going to push back on that. Yeah, yeah. I I think... (sighs) Now, I should say things are changing. We don't make as much of an effort to to get warranties or whatever you would call them on the, on the highways mm-hmm. as built. And I have a friend yeah. who does a lot of trade in ca- Canada and he says, yeah. look, in Canada, you build a road, you better guarantee it for 10 years. Yeah. So there's a, there's an accountability aspect to it yeah. that maybe we don't think is reasonable because we didn't grow up with it. And then there's yeah. the other thing. And I think these two things go hand in hand. There's a shovel ready projects. So this right. is how we're going to get people to right. work attitude where it's like, well, you know, you can always fix the road yeah. and we're not looking at roads as strategic assets. We're not yeah. looking at time lost on highways as an economic obstacle. Yeah. We're actually looking at them. And I, I mean, look, I'm un- entirely unencumbered by fact here. Okay. I'm, this is speculation, no, but it feels like they want to use it as a make work project when people aren't working to, 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 and, and we have, I can say to the listeners, we have 80, customers so we're in eight we're in 15 states where largest customers would be a top 20 city all the way down to small towns and everything in between yeah congratulations by the thank way. you thank it's you what 20 months now yeah yeah 20 months into it so and that, and we're adding probably you know you know five or six a month and we're growing and that's what i was gonna say it's just larger. gonna accelerate yeah, now that yeah. some people don't have to go first yeah. which is all they wanted to avoid so so we have the we have the kind of inside skinny on maybe what maybe motivates city city public works departments and that was my view, by the way, that has always been, you know, some of this seems like a make work kind of thing. Um, I, I don't think so much anymore. I think, I don't think as much of that is, is true anymore. I probably uh, 30, 40 years ago. Okay. Uh, but now what you find is cities just don't have the money they used to have. The gas tax, which was the dominant way of paying for roads, right. really is starting to be just not enough, nearly enough money 
to maintain even our highways, let alone, you know, the, any kind of revenue source for anything else. So we're stealing the money from somewhere else. So we're, we're just, we're just moving money around right now. Right. And so there's a desperate attempt, I think for, for some municipalities to think the way they do in Europe is how do I extend, how do I, how do I extend the useful life of what I have? Yeah. How, how do I, uh, are there ways that and and the simple way that was discovered, you know, by the ancient Romans, which is inspect the road frequently. <laughs> and, and <laughs> yeah, it's and, not complicated. Yeah, check it. Just you know, I always I always tell this story. It's true. It's an interesting art, historical artifact. You know, the Romans uh, built the Appian Way, which is a road that's still available. You can go. You can you can actually walk on the Appian Way that, that they built two thousand years ago, and they inspected them regularly. They actually have a guy called a lictor who sat on a chariot and the chariot rolled down a road and that gentleman was responsible for looking at the road defects and giving it the local road crew right it was a prestigious thing to manage roads julius caesar was actually his first job in government was as a road inspector how about that augustus caesar retained the title of minister of transportation when he became an emperor it was a big deal back then because roads were a strategic asset and they still are and I think the AV revolution is going to bring about, um, you know, we won an award from the American Society for Civil Engineers this year. Congratulations. They do. They give an annual award. It's called a Grand Challenge. And they look at a whole bunch of technologies across the U.S. And they there's 10 categories. And they evaluate it on effectiveness, efficiency, and all that good stuff. <laughs> we actually won in five categories and won their national award for the most innovative civil engineering technology in the United States. I and, don't doubt it, honestly. Yeah, no. I mean, it, and the reason the reason is the the civil engineering profession um, is going through a renaissance because you and I are 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 looking at this infrastructure that we've taken for granted and right. saying, you know, there's got to be a better way. Well, it's not sexy, right? I, yeah. Um, but, but, I, politically, I've been everything that there is, right? There are certain bits that I can drag from my past political lives, right? And the one thing that I, I stand by is that everyone loves to build things and no one loves to maintain them, right? Yeah. Because you don't get to put your name on the thing you maintain. Yes. I think as a, as a sort of um, uh, best practice for management, if you put the name of the person who manages the road on the yeah. road, you may have better results instead yeah. of naming it after like a mayor who's dead or something, right? Yeah. Like there's a, there's a way that I think you could yeah. get better results because right now the glory is in the first time the yeah. road gets cut in and that's not the person who's keeping people alive right now. That's not the person who's yeah. keeping people going to work right now. And, and you know. I agree. I have tremendous empathy for our customers. So if I think of our customers as cities, it's actually public works departments right. specifically. And the challenge that, that our customers have is the only time they get talked to is when something's going wrong. Right. And, and that's a tough job to have where your pat on the back is nobody yelled at you. You know, that's your pat on the <laughs> I've back. I've had that job, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Not that specific right. job, but it was like the best outcome you can hope for. Is nobody complained. Is no one gives you angina. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I had a great day today. Right. I only ate three Tums and that's because I had Thai food. <laughs> right. And I'm telling you the, the public works departments, the people we work, they work hard. And, and I feel good about the fact that we're able to give that group of people a proactive tool yeah. versus a reactive set of tools. And that's one of the challenges when you have a job where you're supposed to take care of something. And the only way you can find out when it's not working is somebody complains to you. Right. That's a tough, not fun job. Well, but it's also it's also an antique, right? That's not the way our businesses work anymore, no. right? You know, so yeah. the fact the fact is that this is oh god, I'm gonna say ripe for disruption. Sorry, it, it's, it's no, it, you, you, right out of the cliche pocket. You 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 used a phrase that's similar to what a VC told me once when they were looking at our company. He goes, "You know what I like about it? It's called it's I call this big and boring." Oh, uh, yeah. Big, lots of money, boring in that nobody's thinking of bringing, uh, certainly nobody, no AI scientist is waking up thinking, let me think about pavement today. Yeah. I, I, wanted, I wanted to sort of follow on this, this thought of, of uh, reactive versus proactive. I went to India and I got a chance to see the Taj Mahal and up close. And people think the Taj Mahal is special until you've, until you can touch it, you mm -hmm. really have to appreciate how extraordinary that structure is. Very detailed. I met a guy who actually uh, it was built by Persians uh, in India, and it was built about 500 years ago. 
And there's a whole tradition of, of families who take care of certain parts of the Taj Mahal. They are the maintenance crew. And it's for, an honor. Yes, for this minaret or this, this particular wall right. or this 16 square feet of floor. And they've been taking care of the, that section of floor in the Taj Mahal for 500 years. And they're very proud of the fact that they've maintained this asset over It is a worldwide years. attraction. It Absolutely. Is, it is something people go out of their way to see. And if you give people whose job it is to take care of things, tools that allow them to, to maintain those things at a high level yeah. and at a, at a high level of quality, then they, ta- they can then take pride in that job and magical things happen. That yeah. asset lasts forever. Young entrepreneurs seem to attract interest mm-hmm. older entrepreneurs seem to have a better record true or mm-hmm. false uh older entrepreneurs if they've done it before yes yeah. sorry i should have clarified yeah, that yeah 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 the, the 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 uh studies i've looked at and i don't i haven't i can't say i'm anything approaching an expert in this uh, but um please yeah but please what, don't pull that leg so hard right, okay right. okay mr 4.9 yeah, on rate right, my professors right, right, right. yes you, you yeah, can sign you up to see me man you do your research yeah. 4.9 ain't a bad score man <laughs> yeah. i'm just saying yeah um you can see mr yeah. desantis at carnegie mellon university <laughs> where apparently if i'm to believe his particular line they just let any schmuck come in who doesn't know anything <laughs> but i i would say um yeah, so what they say, generally speaking, from what they've studied it is um, experience doesn't guarantee success, but it diminishes the likelihood of failure, I guess is the way to think of it. So, um, and I think I know why, um, because the there's a downside to the what I call the one-off success. Uh, and, and the downside happens when I was part of a company that was wildly successful, therefore I'm qualified and I have a, I'm ahead of the game to make a next company successful. Right. The problem with that is there's a major qu- uh, quantity of luck in this game. And I think that's what people need to appreciate is your, if you're a tech entrepreneur, um, and tech in particular, because you're, you're, you're asking for other people for money. If, if you and I want to just open a consulting firm, the risk isn't as high. We can set that up tomorrow. Briefcases aren't that expensive. Exactly. If you're a tech firm, you need lots of money and you need to take a big risk. So the the, the the hard fact of entrepreneurship is you're at a roulette wheel. You're spinning the wheel continuously. As, a, as an entrepreneur, it's how much endurance do you have to be able to stay at that roulette wheel until your number comes up? Your ability to persist is the strongest asset you have because there is a major quotient of luck. And so coming back to the one-time entrepreneur who was wildly successful on the first go, um, they may not appreciate in the next go that that they were extraordinarily lucky, and they may presume a lot of things about what it's going to take for them to win in the next go. Yeah, The entrepreneur who's had a go and they failed, and perhaps failed spectacularly, you appreciate what it really takes to win. You know what you're really up against. And if you're a young person, um, you have a maybe a, another disadvantage and that, that somebody who not only is an experienced entrepreneur has, just by living in the world, just put entrepreneurship aside, just living in the world, you kind of appreciate how the world works and how the world may be. You have a snapshot. Absolutely. You have, a, you have an understanding from a particular perspective. Right. And one of the things you appreciate when you get older is young people learn and everyone learns is the world is constructed to support the status quo. The status quo is what we all take comfort in when, you know, we don't want to have to live with all this uncertainty. When we're making decisions, we want to know that certain things aren't moving. And society's organized to maintain things, and that includes everything from fast food restaurants to to, uh, you know, roads that work, to yep. my job is going to be there when I go work, to you know, I go into PNC tomorrow, I know the company's not going to crater. The problem with that is that runs up and bumps up against entrepreneurship because entrepreneurs want to upturn and overturn that comfortable I, 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 I got to challenge the first part of that though, yeah. right? Because the first thing I like to tell people is you don't know that job is actually going to be there. You've decided yeah. that for navigational purposes True. that the sun will always be on your True. left, right? And you're like, I'm plotting this out, yeah. and I'm just going to assume that north is always going to be that yeah. way. But 
But navigating your life and navigating on a roadmap are two different things because I was yeah. AT&T, I was MCI WorldCom. And then in both of those cases, they went, hey, we found yeah. out we can save a lot of money yeah. if we change the way this works and yeah. fire 40,000 of you. And yeah. this division is now gonna get folded into that one and we're gonna sell this to this foreign company that you don't wanna be a part of. And frankly, the feeling's mutual. You you raise a great point that I always remind uh, people who decided to not pursue a job in a startup. Right where they'll take the 50% higher salary in XYZ company. And I say that, just to just your point, is you may think that provides more certainty, um, but what it does is it gives you more routine, but it doesn't make your life any more stable because you are at risk. You can lose your job. It increases you your, be your ability to believe that it's stable. Exactly. And that's all some people want, right? right? And, and and here, this is the this is the cherry pick question. This is yeah. the one where we're, we're basically totally leading up to, which is um, if you now become aware that maybe, you're, maybe PNC won't be around forever, right? Now you have to stare in the face of, are you just not doing the thing you want to do because somehow you've been led to believe that what getting what you want is wrong? You are, you know, uh, if you read stories about people who've had near death experiences, people who've been on airplane crashes or people who've been in a war or people who've really kind of faced that ultimate d uh, demise, we all ultimately come to right. someday when they faced it f right in their face a lot of those people change their lives. Yes. And they change their lives and they don't know why. And often in people who've studied this have discovered that once you face a fear and you face an ultimate fear, you begin to think differently about all the other fears you have. Right. <laughs> and then you start getting a little bit more, I'm just going to use the word courageous. You start thinking, you know what? I have dreams. I have things I believe in, and you know what? I'm going to fight for those things. Why and, do I keep withholding the thing that I think I want? Yeah, and 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 all of those fears that that after that threshold experience, all those fears that for whatever reason they become trivial, and suddenly you you're you're sort of released, and you're saying, you know what? I'm going to climb K2. I'm going to start that business. I'm going to run for office. I'm going to challenge that that guy down the street. I'm going to do all those things that formerly, for whatever reason, I was timid about. And that's one of the beautiful things about entrepreneurship. People think about it as getting rich. I can be my own boss. I get to wear sneakers. Girls, to, are, girls will take my calls. <laughs> right, right. Those things really are so uh, unimportant in the end. It, when you really get down to it, the the the, the visceral impact of facing your worst fears. You know, I'm going to run, I'm going to be bankrupt. I'm going to run out of money. I'm not going to, I'm going to use up my savings. My poor kids are just never going to eat. And they're never going to eat, you know, and, and I, and I, and I, I risk saying this, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to step over the line here a little bit. Go nuts. There, there are people out there who have families to take care of. And I get that. Mm -hmm. And, and they have an obligation to that family. And that obligation is financial to make sure those the, that family is financially secure. But they also have another obligation to the family is to see the, the mother or father fully express who they are and living a life with their chin out, yeah. courageously pursuing what they believe in. 100%. That is far more, that, that as a lesson to your kids is far more valuable than any other thing you could possibly do for your kids is to have the example of a courageous mother or father full on pursuing their dreams fearlessly. Don't stick the that. Disney tape in there and go like, they'll tell you to live your dream. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. Right. Bambi will tell you to live your dream. Yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> when they see an example of that, yeah. the best entrepreneurs, interestingly, the best entrepreneurs have had an entrepreneur in their life. Yes. And as often as a parent, an uncle or a close relative. You've been reading my diary. Yeah. I, you and I were at the uh, at the founder event a yeah, couple nights yeah, ago yeah. where Matt Vendeville and Rachel were the last two presentations. Those two 
who have both been on this show, by the way, both come from entrepreneurial families and you can feel it as soon as they get up there. It's like, there is an understanding that they are now like meeting with their destiny. Yeah. And, um, we are running super close to like, like stepping on Tony Robbins's hashtags and Google AdWords right now. You know, I feel like we got to get that, that eye of the tiger playing in the background. Be like, go fight, win. But all seriousness, um, you know, I ask this of you because you've seen the up, you've seen the down. Yeah. And yep. And every time I've ever seen you talk, it's never been anything about um the uh the glamour, the fashion, the like this is this is the way everyone has to do it because once everybody starts doing something, that's when you're in trouble. Right. right. So let me um let me bring this to a close by sending everybody to Roadbotics, which is R O A D. B O T I C S dot com. Yep. Check them out. Yeah. I'm here to tell you, like if you're listening to this show And we're any, hiring too, by the way. Are you? Who, what are you looking for? We're looking for techies, software engineers, data scientists. Uh we're also looking for what I would call labelers and drivers. These would be more hourly uh nice. folks. We're looking for sales folks. Uh, you know, every business thing you function you could think of, we're looking for people. Mark DeSantis, Roadbotics, check them Thanks. out. Thanks. Thank you. All right, that's all the time we've got. Thanks to Mark and everybody at Roadbotics. Uh, by all means, check out roadbotics.com. Find out whether or not uh, your skills match some of their openings. I uh, I think you could be tied up with a lot worse people. Uh, <laughs> you can learn a lot. I know some of the folks over there. It is a very high quality group. Uh, if not, uh, at least you know take some of these these insights and and use them in your day to day. Buzzy and I are going to get back into the lab. We're going to make another one of these. We'll catch you next Wednesday. Take care of yourselves in the meantime. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.